Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here with us. And as you open up your words this evening, I believe that you will set us, your people, your children, free from all bondage, deception, and sin. Give us ears that we may hear your voice, saying, this is the way, walk you in it. We pray also, you will give us eyes that we may discern, discern sin under any guise, examining ourselves to see if we are of the faith, in the faith of Jesus Christ. Be with husband, be with wife, be with family, and prepare us for your coming. Forgive us of our sins, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, we are here for another session going through the sanctuary, marriage reconciliation through the sanctuary. And the theme that we are working with this evening, expel demons, sexual excess, and animal practices. But before we go any further, we do have a disclaimer to share with God's people this evening. Right, Hillary? Yes. Based on the content of this evening's study, we would ask that children uh, would not be present to view this particular episode of the broadcast. So if you have something or somewhere for them to do, we will give you the opportunity to uh, do that. But we do not advise the children to be present during this particular broadcast. So we'll give you a few moments to get situated. And as we look at this whole theme, marriage reconciliation through God's sanctuary, and this is part five of our series. And again, we want to encourage you to meditate upon the principles laid out in part one through part number four. Now, on the screen, we can see here the layout of the sanctuary. And we have been journeying from part one, Hillary, amen? Yes. From the courtyard, we have gone to each post of ministration, and now we're looking at the experience in the holy place, where your husband and wife are journeying together through God's sanctuary to bring about reconciliation. And we are here at the showbread in the holy place. However, where's the goal, the end goal? Well, the end result is for both spouses to end up in the most holy place, which means that both spouses need to have a most holy experience. And we can find this in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 19. Now, a few sessions ago, I believe part three, we covered looking at the bread, correct? And we saw that there are 12 loaves in that holy place. 12 loaves. Yes. And uh, the loaves, the bread, typify whom? Typify Jesus Christ. John 6, 48, right? That's right. And the bread, the loaves, also point to what? To the Word of God. The Word of God. And we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and verse number 17, where God's Word says every scripture, all scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God or husband and wife may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. So if there must be reconciliation, we must see what the bread, what the word of God says. Amen? Amen. So here we are looking at the bread and one of those loaves tell us that in order for us to have a successful marriage between husband and wife, a successful marriage between the individual and Christ, what must we close and seal? The sacred circle that is around each husband and wife. As you can see on the screen right there, that there is a sacred circle around each husband and wife together. And we saw this principle laid out in... Adventist Home, and uh, page 177, paragraph 1, and paragraph number 2. So now we're looking at, again, page 337, paragraph 3, 
of Adventist home. Then as we looked at the sacred circle, Hillary, we saw that there were something else to be found in that sacred circle. What, what, what is that? What are those two things? Well, there were two individual circles which would represent the husband and Christ and also the wife and Christ. Inner circles, as it were. There it is. And Hillary, as we see that there is a sacred circle around husband and wife, and also that there are two inner circles, one with the husband and Christ and the wife and Christ, right? Right. What do these two inner circles point to, imply, as we saw in our previous session? Each person's individuality in Christ. As we see, and this individuality God gave to Adam, God gave to Eve, correct? Yes. And this individuality is choice, will. And as God did not make robots, but he made human beings mm -hmm. with choice and, and, and will to make their decisions, God does not want man or woman to use that individuality to go against him. Amen? Amen. Let's read this statement just for emphasis and reiteration. Page 17, education. Every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the creator, individuality, power to think and to do. And we see in Councils on Health, page 243, while each will manifest an individuality, yet it should be an individuality that is under the control of the Holy Spirit. So now, we saw that when God gave man his individuality, that many a husband, many a wife abuse that God-given individuality. Is that so? Yes, by merging their individuality into that of another. And they also abuse the other spouse's individu individuality by trying to make that other spouse submit to them in whatever particular they would have them to submit. And we see those principles in the life of Adam and Eve, how they merged their God-given individuality into each other and went off into sin. And after sin, what did God say to man and to woman? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16 about rulership. Well, that the husband would be the head of the wife. Shall I rule, right? Yes. And how has man today trampled, husband today trampled upon that God-given principle. We're told in volume three, page 484. It says, watch carefully, that after sin, Eve, all right, skip on down, second sentence, Eve, she was to be in subjection to her husband. And this was a part of the curse. In many cases, how many cases? Many. The curse has made the lot of woman very grievous and her life a burden. The superiority which God has given man, he has abused mm. in many respects by exercising arbitrary power. So has this statement confirmed that husbands, many of them, have trampled, misinterpreted, misapplied Genesis 3.16, the man shall rule over his wife, right? Correct. There is a second scripture which is going to launch us, which is going to catapult us into our deep lesson of study this evening. And that scripture that many husbands and wives have misapplied is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and verse 5 in the context of their God-given individuality. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 4. Let's see what God's word says here. The bread. Amen. Okay. So verse 4 says, The wife hath not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. Verse 5. Let's pause in verse 5. Okay. So here we see, again, read verse 4, Hillary. The wife hath not power over her own body, mm -hmm. but the husband. Mm. And likewise also, the husband hath no power over his own body, but the wife. So how would a surface reader comprehend that verse? Well, they would take it to mean that whenever the one spouse desires to ha enter into sexual relations, that the other spouse must give in. That and any other thing. Right. Right. I own you. 
Makes sense now, Correct. but the context is clear mm -hmm. about the body. Right. The body, right? Now, b before we delve into this, th this verse, let's take a look at one extreme. And that extreme is, which we're not going to address in this study, and this extreme is in the context of sexual intercourse, wherein when one of, you know, both spouses abstain from sexual intercourse, hold her body aloof from the husband, his body aloof from the wife, for many reasons. But listen to what God's word says now in verse 5. Defraud ye not one Correct. the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And of course, that word defraud means to deprive, deprive not, okay? Mm -hmm. That's one extreme. We, we won't address that this evening. But let's go to the farther extreme of this spectrum here, wherein the husband, let's begin with him first. The husband claims that whenever he wants to have sex, the wife must give in. And he says, well, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4 says, I have control over your body. And what happens is before we dig into this, of course, it's a misinterpretation and a misapplication because Paul by no means is uh, condoning intemperance in right. anything, not even in sexual intercourse. Before I go deeper, let's read that scripture. Notice we're in 1 Corinthians 7, correct? Yes. Verse 4, verse 5, right? Mm -hmm. Just jump over to 1 Corinthians 9. So this verse, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 4, cannot be used sincerely to justify excess in sexual intercourse. Right, even if you're married. Thank you so much. All right. Verse 25, 1 Corinthians 9. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. How many things? All things. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Mm. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body yes. and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So is Paul promoting uh, intemperance? No. By no means. The bread cannot contradict itself. Thank you so much, Hilary. Mm -hmm. So now go back to 1 Corinthians 7. Now, verse number 4. So here is where the husband says, now, now this scripture says, whenever I want it, Sexual intercourse, wife, you must give it to me. And we are going to drill very deep in this study. But before we go any further, just in case there are safe to serve international members now watching and others, I want to say this. If you have children in your midst, kindly get them busy doing something else. Remove them from this broadcast this evening, please. We will be addressing adult content in the Lord based on scripture. And since these things that we will be discussing are written in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, why must we be silent? Why? And I'm going to say this. It is a neglect of ministers dealing with these subjects why so many husbands and wives are intemperate and that they are about to lose their salvation on these points on these points. So this by no means is just a discussion, a Bible study on the flesh. It has everything to do with man's three spheres, which are? The physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Thank you so much. Go back there now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 4. And Sister White says, this scripture has been abused along with another scripture. Let's combine two scriptures and then read the quote. First. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, chapter 7, verse 4. Go now to Ephesians chapter 5. And let's take that verse, verse 22, 23. Okay. Uh, it says here, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So what is that last phrase? As unto the submit, Lord. Submit, right? Right. Look at this statement right here. This is testimonies on sexual behavior, page 25, it says this. No, that's not what I want, pardon me. Adventist home, page 125, paragraph one. 
Husbands should be careful, attentive, constant, faithful, and compassionate. They should manifest love and sympathy. If they fulfill the words of Christ, their love will not be of a base, earthly, sensual character that will lead to the destruction of their own bodies and bring upon their wives debility and disease. Now, what's that last phrase, Hillary? Uh, that they will not bring upon their own bodies, I'm sorry, destruction of their own bodies and bring upon their wives debility and disease. They will not indulge in the gratification of base passions. Husbands now, they will not indulge in the gratification of base passions. Watch carefully. While ringing in the ears of their wives, that the wives must be subject to the husband in everything. Do you see there the context? Yes. How they have misinterpreted, misapplied 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4. Correct. Ephesians 5, 23, 22. And also Colossians 3, 18, which says, uh, Wives, submit unto, your, unto your, your own husbands as is fit in, in the, the Lord. Lord. Mm -hmm. When the husband. When the husband has the nobility of character, purity of heart, elevation of mind that every true Christian must possess. Mm. It will be made manifest in the marriage relation. If he has the mind of Christ, he will not be a destroyer of the body, mm. but will be full of tender love, seeking to reach the highest standard in Christ. You know, when I think about individuality, I think about stewardship. Yes. You know, we are stewards of our own bodies. God has um, entrusted us to take care of these bodies. And so you mentioned the three spheres, spiritual, physical, mental, and spiritual. And anything that would imperil our um, lives in any of those areas, we owe it to God to be good stewards of our body. And anything that goes against that um, goes against God's word. And so we must submit firstly to the right. Lord. Let's take one more scripture because this is intemperance, right? And it shows that when a husband as in the context, all right, is forcing, compelling his wife to be intemperate in, in even sexual intercourse. He doesn't have, he lacks the fruit of the Spirit of God. Because chapter 5 of Galatians, mm -hmm. verse 22, verse 23, the last part of the fruit is what? Temperance. Temperance. It's the foundation. It's temperance. He lacks this. Right. Is that point clear, my friends? And the first is love. And if you really had true love for your spouse, you, would you wouldn't be seeking to gratify yourself for pleasure. It's not about you feeling good or getting some type of relief. It would be about, you know, the love that we've been referencing in this series, 1 Correct. Corinthians 13. It's not all about self and wanting to gratify uh, lust. Now, let's define excess. And when I went through the spirit of prophecy and I looked at her writings, the Bible, and looking at how she defined excess in sexual intercourse, it has nothing to do with days because everybody's, every person's body is different. But it's more so with what, Hillary? With the effects, the symptoms, the effects physically, mentally, spiritually, morally, etc. Now, as we were going through this, you know, I mean, I mean, before this point, we came up with some num a number system. But we don't want to give you our own words, do we? No, we want to stay, stay with the Bible and the spirit of prophecy as she addresses excess. Not so by days, but by what, Hillary? By the effects that it has on the, on the person's character. Look at this. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. Right. Excess. How it affects the body and mind. That is how you know when you are intemperate in sexual intercourse, right? Look at this again. Maybe we'll give you our number system. It says right here, Adventist Home, page 124, paragraph 4. Sexual excess will eventually destroy... Effectually. Sexual excess will effectually... Thank you, Hillary. Will effectually destroy a love for devotional exercises. Wow. Let's finish this sentence. We'll take from the brain, sexual excess, will take from the brain the substance needed to nourish the system and will most effectively exhaust the vitality. What is that saying there? Let's finish it. No woman 
should aid her husband in this work of self-destruction. She will not do it if she is enlightened and has true love for her husband. All right? Mm -hmm. So how, what signs denote sexual excess well, based on that paragraph? Mm -hmm. Three things are given. So firstly, it's in the um, spiritual realm. It will destroy a love for devotional exercises. So of course, we're, we're saying take an introspect, because be honest with yourself. If you have no relish, no time, no desire um, to go in the word and spend time in earnest prayer and study of the scripture and reading the word of God, you can probably, you might be able to trace it back to sexual excess. And since we are addressing here right now the husbands, for husbands, notice, I didn't say men, but for husbands, you know the draft, the let down feeling you have after sexual intercourse. And many times as husbands, and I've heard testimonies, many a husbands have also testified that many times they oversleep in the mornings. All right, so if you keep this up, what's gonna happen to your morning devotion? It goes by the what's, wayside. Again, what is gonna happen to your morning devotion? Then for that day and those days, you do not receive the manna the that bread. God falls the bread, thank mm -hmm, you, Hillary, mm -hmm. that God sends down. And when the sun rises, what happens, what happens to that manna? It melts. It melts. Mm -hmm. What happens to your personal devotion? So to satisfy the flesh, you are doing it at the expense of your spiritual walk with the Lord. Wow. And if a wife sees that, then she must know, okay, nothing tomorrow morning. Make sense now? You get the point. Right. And friends, we're trying... We're holding the horses not to go too deep on these points, all right? But I know you can comprehend what's happening here. Number two is in, so first we have the spiritual. Yes. Secondly, we have the mental. It says um, it will take from the brain the substance needed to nourish the system. Correct. So while the brain need and think about it, the brain is what we use to communicate with, with God. God and what God uses to communicate with us. So if you're having vital substances, nutrients, vitamins, things Correct. taken from the brain, how can you focus mentally? Correct. You know, how can you even commune with God or appreciate what he's trying to reveal to no. you if you if your brain is not adequately nourished? And then and then what happens is you become irritable easily. Mm -hmm. Because you know that when a person is intemperate, lacks sleep, that morning he wakes up, I mean, how does he act? Irritable. If, if this is a consistent uh, doing, a trend. Mm -hmm. See? So you see what happens to character there now. Right. Thirdly, and will most effectively exhaust the vitality. Physically now. That's it. Mm -hmm. So no you see, energy. physically, mentally, and spiritually. and spiritually, in that one paragraph. One sentence, really. All right. Mm -hmm. On page 122, the husband and wife. This is not our words now, by, by supposition, no. They, husband and wife, do not see that God requires them to control their married lives from any excesses. But very few, few, very few feel it to be a religious duty to govern their passions. They have you united themselves in marriage to the object of their choice and therefore reason that marriage sanctifies the indulgence of the baser passions. What are they saying there? They're saying, well, because we're married, just any time, however frequent we want to engage, we have that liberty. A few hours ago, we were talking and you mentioned about Adam and Eve, how many times a husband and a wife would agree on something and they think, well, because we agree to right. do this, then God has to accept it. Talk to Satan, to serve her. Well, you had mentioned, I mentioned that point, but the point that you mentioned that, you said that Adam and Eve both agreed to go against God and mm. to sin. Adam agreed with Eve that it was more important for him to be united with her in sin so they consented, as it were, both against God, but God did not sanction that. So, so they were on one accord, but in sin. Right. All right. And here we have, even if husband and wife, as we just read, are on one accord in sexual excess, what does the bread say? The word of God. Right. Back to the screen. It says this. Watch carefully. Even men and women professing godliness, men and women, all right? Professing godliness, give loose rein 
to their lustful passions and have no thought that God holds them accountable for the expenditure of vital energy. Which weakens their hold on life and innervates the entire system. Now, just imagine that yeah. God, we're stewards of our health and God wants us to use our health to go out and share the message of salvation with, right. with the world. But if you have no energy because you're expending all of your vital force in sexual intercourse, what what relish would you even have for it? So you're not having devotion. You're not um, even interested in witnessing to other people, all for indulging in Correct. sexual passion. So life is all about sex now. And we'll get to that later on. I mean, we'll get to that. Now, I have been waiting for approximately, I think about 17 years now to address this topic. And the reason why I say that is because I remember at Oakwood a few years back, years back, and we were in class with the theology majors and this topic came up about sex between husband and wife and how should pastors counsel husband and wife who are sexually active. And somewhere, somehow, I can't remember all the details, but somewhere, somehow, the professor and the students were on one accord also proclaiming that it was okay for a husband and a wife to have sex on the Sabbath. Intemperance. And I was the only voice in the class with another person saying, that is wrong. The Sabbath is for us to glorify God with our mind, our body, and spirit. Why, why, why should we take that one day out of seven to, to uh, satisfy, mm -hmm. that's the word, and to gratify each other? This could not be right. And they, were, and they were saying, well, Hebrews 13 verse 5 says that marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled. So whatever you do in the marriage context in your bedroom, it's okay, even if it is on the Sabbath. Friends, even now, I still am against that. And let me tell you, no, that Brett means... is against it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just imagine these ministers teaching their flock. It's okay to have sex, husband and wife, on the Sabbath. Let's take a look at some scriptures here, my friends. Let's go to Exodus. Exodus, well, well first of all, go to Isaiah 58. Mm -hmm. Now, what says Isaiah 58, verse 13? We're to abstain from our own pleasures on God's holy day. Whose pleasure? Let's read that to make sure it's in the Bible still. All right. Isaiah 58 and verse number 13. Mm -hmm. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, mm. and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, mm. nor speaking thine own words. Now, now here comes a critic now. Well, when I have sex with my spouse, I'm not having uh, or gratifying my pleasure, it's for my wife. Again, the Sabbath is to glorify who? Man or God? God. God, not your spouse, not yourself. Right. Okay? And we talked about how the vital force is um, Lord pulled Lord. away. So, I mean, the Sabbath is not a day for work or not for your energy to be expended on self-pleasure or pleasing somebody else. No wonder some of these ministers have these tame, lifeless, domesticated messages on the Sabbath. I wonder what they're doing before they get to church. So now, go with me now, with us, to Exodus chapter 19. If you remember... In chapter 19 of Exodus, God is about to come closer to his people, to speak to his people. The law. Uh, mm -hmm. The law, which also included the Sabbath. And what instruction did God give to Moses to give to the people, especially to the husbands? Come not near your wives. wives. Mm -hmm. Because God is coming now. To draw closer to his people, God is going to declare his Sabbath. Come not near your... Your wives. Now, that's not talking about come not close in proximity. Right. But we understand the context. Verse 15, chapter 19, verse 15. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Mm. Okay, amen. Now, look at that word carefully, that phrase. Come not near your wife. At your wife. 
okay, at your wife. And what else? And be ready against what day? Against the third day. Now, friends, I want to say this. If you lose such vital force, vi vital force, vitality, you lose some life in this sexual intercourse. Christ died on that Friday, right, the sixth day, and rose on which day? The third day. Let that sink in. That went over your heads. That's okay. All right. Back to the scriptures here. Well, okay. No, <laughs> Hillary. Let's move on, please. Okay. All right. So now, if husbands and wives are being taught by ministers, it's okay to have sexual intercourse on the Sabbath. It shows that they're intemperate. God gave man six days to work and do all your labor, all of your pleasure, but leave my Sabbath. If, you, if these men, pastors, elders, husbands, wives, cannot give God one day, cannot be abstinent from sexual intercourse for one day, I guarantee you, number two, many of them are having sexual intercourse when their wives are on their menstrual cycle. If you cannot give God one day, then you're intemperate. Right. And I've heard people say, well, if I'm practicing, um, what do we call that? What? When we don't want our wives to get pregnant? What do we oh, call that? birth control. It's okay, kind of, birth control, yeah. then have sexual intercourse during her menstrual cycle. When the Bible says she's what? Talk to me, Hillary. Unclean. See Unclean. that now? And, and, and thirdly, are you putting these points down? Breaking God's Sabbath one day of the week. And because they're intemperate there, then it leads to what now? You can't be temperate for, let's say, seven days in the month or five to seven days in the month. Because if you cannot say no one time, you will never say no seven times. When a wife, when your wife is on her menstrual cycle, that is just uh, gross. Unhygienic. Okay, well, number, I mean, three. number three, depraved. number three, number three. And uh, I, I never knew this, but when we were having our first child, Christian, and as I was going through, because again, it was first to us, I'm reading, I'm reading, and I came across a beautiful statement, a number of them actually, which says that when a woman is pregnant, at that time, the husband should not have sexual intercourse. When a wife is pregnant, the, the minute the husband knows wife is pregnant, abstain from sex until that baby comes. But the world says something different. Just turn on your side, wives. Look at the statement right here. This is from the book, A Solemn Appeal. James White, Ellen White, page 94, page 95. The father. The father was, perhaps, born with strong sexual passions which have never been controlled, and the mother may have inherited similar conditions. They have married without any appreciation of what true marriage is, and too often solely or principally for the gratification of the animal passions, for lust and not for love. The child is begotten in mere passion. Mm. The father transmits his propensities to indulgence, along with the excitement of irritation of the sexual organs arising from those propensities. And not only this, but the sexual passion is indulged during pregnancy. The what now? The sexual passion... passion is indulged during? During pregnancy. Watch this, which causes the mother, the mother, to transmit doubly of the direful ill to the offspring within her womb, while at the same time, the nervous force expended detracts just so much from the rights of the child to inherit a strong, well-balanced, and healthy organiz organization. Every orgasm, every orgasm expends of the mother's vitality. So not, not only men now. Right. It's a balance. Every orgasm expends of the mother's vitality, a portion that should go to nourish and develop her babe. Hmm. Very much of the weakness and lassitude experienced during pregnancy is due to the exhaustion, exhaustion consequent upon the sexual embrace, and the forming child must suffer from its effects. For the mother cannot impart what she does not herself possess, health and strength, 
with elasticity of mind and earnestness of purpose. So wow. you think about that. So here's a mother now trying to gratify her own pleasure or even that of her husband while who is suffering in the womb? The child. The child is suffering and in the womb. Sometimes yes. they're, they're perplexed as to why yes. the child comes out with certain defects and deformities. So here comes a husband. You mean, Pastor, I have to abstain from sexual intercourse for nine months? I can't handle that. Then how are you going to be in heaven? Go to John 6 with us. Go to John 6. Because we are covering the bread. Mm -hmm. And do you remember when Christ laid, laid out the bread, laid out the bread to them? And what did many of the Jews say? This is a hard, hard saying. saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, who can do this? Right. I mean, who can keep? It's a hard saying. Who can bear this? And then verse 6 to 6, that's verse 60. Mm -hmm. 6 to 3. And now verse 6 to 6 says what, Hillary? From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Read that verse, verse 60. Verse 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is an hard saying, who, who can, can hear it? it? Now, okay, don't lose that thought. I can't abstain for nine months. Don't lose that thought, all right? Now, can we say we can do all things through Christ? Amen. All right? And if you, real, if you think about it, if you love that child in the womb, that helps you. Right. If you love that child in the womb, you're no longer trying to have a selfish pleasure, right? Gratify self, but you want your son or your daughter to be, right? To be healthy. To be healthy. Right. And also, yes. it affects them morally. Correct. As and well. Which we shall cover later on. Mm -hmm. And that's why we go back to 1 Corinthians 13. Because love seeketh not her. Not her own. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love seeketh not her own. On that point, number four, number four, the ways excess is seen. Many a, many a man or a woman gets married because they cannot control their passion for sex. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Hmm. And they quote and recite Paul, which says, marry then burn. Right. As if Paul is saying, if you can't control yourself, then just go ahead and get married. And many times they get married for the wrong reason, and they get married to the wrong person, get married at the wrong time, and then by and by, they will still burn. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians, right, because chapter seven. Intemperate. Exactly, verse eight, I believe, or verse nine. Verse eight, verse nine. Okay, verse nine. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. Give me verse eight, Hillary, please. Okay. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Thank you so much. So can we abide even as Paul abode? Yes. As Christ abode, unmarried. Right. So why are we saying it's difficult just to abstain for nine months? Come on. Right. But or, if, or even one week. Or, yeah, or one day or out of the week. Thank you so Sabbath. much, Hillary. Thank you so much. <laughs> Go ahead. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. As if Paul is trying, is, is saying, get married because you can't control yourself. Then when you get married, you will be uncontrollable still. Make sense? Right. That will not, um, that's not a okay. band-aid or a Correct. remedy for your intemperance. Thank you so much. Now, let me ask you a question. Hillary, is a marriage relation between a husband and a wife, is that connection primarily mental and spiritual or is it physical? Which one should it be? The Primarily former. mental and spiritual or physical? The former. It must be mental and spiritual. Right. Think about this. A husband and a wife are married. They are enjoying each other in every way based on God's word, right? Let's say providentially, let's say God forbid, uh, the wife gets sick. And based on the sickness and the infirmity, the husband, both of them can no longer enjoy sexual intercourse. What is the husband going to do now? Divorce his wife? Does that make sense to you, friends? So if your connection with your spouse is merely physical, all about sex, then what if your spouse gets into a serious accident right. and, from, and get crippled and from this point forward can no longer you know, perform sexual intercourse? Are you now going to commit adultery? No. Right. Or no. turn to self-abuse. 
thank you so much. No, no. Right? Makes right. sense? And that's why, write down this quotation. I'm going to give you a spin-off from this quotation. It's Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 567. Sister White says, if children and youth, who and who? Children and youth. Were taught that they eat to live and not live to eat, there will be far less disease and far less corruption in the world. So we eat to live and not what, Hillary? Not live, live to, to eat. eat. Let's put a spin on this in the marriage now, right? Sex is a part of marriage, but many spouses make uh, marriage all about sex. Right. And not only the accident aspect of it, but when a woman reaches menopausal age, Thank you, you know, of course, her hormone levels drop. And so, you know, there may be a time when she is not able or Correct. it's painful or undesirable at Correct. that point. You know, what is he going to do? Throw her, <laughs> throw her away? Adventist homepage 124. Notice what we're told in the bread from God's word about sexual excess. If the person refused to be temperate, look what God's word says here. The more the animal passions are indulged, the stronger do they become, and the more violent will be their clamors for indulgence. Wow. It's like an addiction. Mm. It becomes stronger and stronger. Let God-fearing men and women awake to their duty. Many professed Christians are suffering with paralysis of nerve and brain because of their intemperance in this direction. So now... If husbands and wives do not learn sexual temperance, what 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 would happen to them, Hillary? Paralysis of what? Of nerve. Nerve. And what brain. else? Brain. Brain. Now that means many people are sick today in the church because they were never taught to be temperate, even in sexual intercourse. Mm -hmm. That's how important this study is. Let's right. move on. Yes. And if you're paralyzed in your brain, mm. how can you even think to make right decisions? Correct. So it affects Correct. you in every single area Correct. of your life. The animal passions, cherished and indulged, become very strong in this age, and untold evils in the marriage life are the sure results. In the place of the mind being developed and having the controlling power, the animal propensities rule over the higher and nobler powers until they are brought into subjection to the animal propensities. Propensities. What is the result? Women's delicate organs are worn out and become diseased. Hold on. So if husbands and wives are, are intemperate, what is the result? What may be the result? What will be the result? Women's delicate organs are worn out and become diseased. So the very organs that you're abusing, now it's, taken, it's forced to be taken away from you. Childbearing is no more safe. Sexual privileges are abused. Men are corrupting their own bodies, and the wife has become a bed servant to their inordinate base lusts until there is no fear of God before their eyes. Let's talk about the factors that lead to, to excess in sexual intercourse. Please put these points down. The factors that lead husbands and wives to become intemperate in sexual intercourse. What's the first one? Now, just everybody, tell me, what, does, what did God say about Noah's day and Lot's day? They were what? Eating and drinking. What's the first thing they were doing? Eating. And what? And drinking. Then what? Marrying and, and giving in marriage. So let's start right there. Food. Right. Intemperance in eating. If you're intemperate in eating, it's going to carry over to the other areas of Correct. your life. Correct. That's it right there, food. But specifically in this area, we're talking about animal-based foods, flesh foods. Put down flesh foods. So a husband, even a wife, a husband who has not gotten victor over flesh foods, many times, 9 to 9.9%, .9%, they will be intemperate in sex, sexual intercourse. And with the animal food, the flesh food, also spices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, friends, I am from a culture that love spicy foods. And if you go back to my culture, 
And when I say my culture, I mean, you know, Caribbean. my birth in Jamaica. Many times in that culture, you know, you are not a man if you cannot perform and perform frequently. What happens is now it leads many of those young men to start having sexual intercourse from an early age to show that they are men, right? Mm -hmm. they, they have grown and also having multiple partners. And many times, some of these folks become Seventh-day Adventists. That's where I'm going. They become Seventh-day Adventists and they carry over the same sexual excess in the marriage. And if the wife says no, right, based on the excess, then he gets angry, right? Right, uh, becomes an animal. Exactly. <laughs> Resentment follows, adultery follows, divorce follows, and the whole list. Pornography, uh, masturbation, because since my wife refuses to satisfy my lust, I'm going to do it myself. Mm. Look at the statement right here. What is the result? Food and spices. Right. Animal food. Look at the statement right here. Councils on diet and foods, page 231 and page 341. They tempt their children to indulge their appetite by placing upon their tables flesh meats and other food prepared with spices. What is the end result now? Which have a tendency to excite the animal passions. That's it right there. And what's our theme? With marriage, reconciliation through God's sanctuary, expel what? Demons, sexual excess, and animal practices. So we have to go to the very root. What is the cause? Mm -hmm. John the Baptist, in the of him, he placed the ax where? At the uh, leaves? No. The twigs? No. Where? At the root. The root. Amen. So what's the root here, Hillary? Flesh, Flesh foods, and? And spices. Next, next paragraph. Spices at first irritate the tender coating of the stomach, but finally destroy the natural sensitiveness of this delicate membrane. The blood becomes fevered. The animal propensities are aroused, mm. while the moral and intellectual powers are weakened and become servants to the baser passions. The mother should study to set a simple yet nutritious diet before her family. And along with the flesh foods and the spices, there is a group of foods that the world called aphrodisiac. And in that, we find also caffeinated foods such as? Chocolate. Chocolate. Mm -hmm. They create a feverish blood and they stir up the animal passions and you begin to act animal-like. We'll get to that point. Go with me now to Genesis 19. So besides or along with flesh foods, spices in those flesh foods, right? And then we have the aphrodisiac foods. Number four, we have wine and strong oh, yeah. drink. What, yeah. my friends? Wine, wine and, and strong, strong drink. drink. Now, chapter 19 of Genesis, I believe we're looking at the life of Lot mm -hmm. and Lot's two daughters. Talk to me, say to serve local. All right, those online, we can't hear you now. But what did Lot's two daughters do to him? They gave him, they got him drunk. wine to drink. And as he got drunk, what happened, Hillary? Well, mm. they had intercourse with their own father mm. and they became pregnant, mm. both of the daughters. So were they acting like animals now? Yes. Just imagine that. And if you look at animals, think about that. Lot's two daughters in, one, in two nights. Lot, animal-like. Makes sense now? Wine. Right. right. And yet we have ministers saying we can drink a little wine. And when you so we have to get to the root. Yes, go ahead. When you me. mention wine, I think we also have to mention fermentation at any stage. Correct. So that goes along with Thank the you. ciders and Thank the vinegars, yes, et, yes, et cetera. Yes, Anything yes. that's fermented, yes. whether it's lightly fermented or highly yes. fermented, it has that same effect. And if you look at God's original diet, none of these things tend to those ends. So if you want to know what excites the animal passions and leads into excess, it's everything that God said, do not eat. Those are the things that will lead to the animal propensities and the excess. And they were eating and drinking, right? Yes. Marrying and giving it into marriage, into right? Marriage. Next on your paper, put this point down. Factors that lead to sexual excess, overeating. So no, not only flesh foods now, but you can be on a plant-based diet 
but because you overeat, you benumb your spiritual sensibilities. And now you begin to act on the lower frequency, lower passions, the loss of the flesh, not the power of the mind, the spiritual mind. Make sense now? Right. You begin to carry out the loss of the flesh, flesh. overeating. Even of the right types of food, Thank as you. you said. Look at this mm -hmm. statement here. Maranatha, page 62. The controlling power of appetite. No, let me give you gospel workers first. Same, same quote, page 230. It begins by saying, The indulgence of appetite beclouds. Overeating now, right? Yes. The indulgence of appetite beclouds and fetters the mind. And what, Hillary? And, and blunts. blunts the holy emotions of the soul. So if it blunts, if overeating blunts the holy emotions of the soul, where are you operating at? Off of your, your feelings, your passions, Thank your you so desires, much. your Thank base you. desires. Overeating stupefies the entire being by diverting the energies from the other organs to do what now? The work of okay. the stomach. Maranatha on top, page 62, the controlling power of appetite. Will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory mm. over every other temptation of Satan. But those? But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. Now, put this point down on your paper. Another factor that leads to sexual excess in the bedroom is eating late at night. Because now you got to exercise. Eating late at night. So you, you break one law of nature. Late night eating, then you become intemperate. Right. That's how Satan sets us up. Eating and drinking, then you carry out your animal propensities. The next one on the paper is this thing right here. Your senses. What is it, this one, Hillary? What you Hearing hear. What you music. Hear. Mm -hmm. Go to Psalm 101. Music. Certain songs we listen to, especially what we call love songs, right? And R&B songs, the walls. Right. These type of songs. Sensual it, songs. Thank you so much, Hillary. And That's a lot word. of people will Talk say, um, there's people, even ministers, that will say, okay, uh, let's not listen to secular music. However, mm. if you're in the bedroom, you can put this kind of music on because it's just between you, you know, it's just between spouses, husband and wife. It's wrong. That music should not be listened to. Anything Period. that is not glorifying God should not be listened to in any context whatsoever. Period. And most of these love songs, it, well, I won't even go there because even the lyrics of some of these songs, it's all about the flesh. That's what it's about. It's not and about 1 Corinthians 13. It has 13. nothing to do with 1 Corinthians 13. No, it? or glorifying God. Whether you, wherefore, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Philippians 4.8. Right. Whatsoever Think on these things. things. Exactly. Psalm 101. And lastly, and there's so much we can say in this little section here, the factors that lead to excess in, in sexual intercourse, a whole slew, a whole plethora of things could go right here. But let's talk about now sight. The diet and of the mind. And friends, I'm going to share with you a statement. Mm, mm, mm. All right. The what, Hillary, of the mind? The diet of the mind. Thank you. So, and yes? I just wanted to say, in the layout of the sanctuary, because we're talking about reconciliation in the sanctuary, we mentioned that God, um, he communicates with us through our minds. So would that not be the most holy place where God's presence wants to dwell? He wants to put his name, his character in our minds. So if we're filling our minds with this worldly music, we're filling our minds and our eyes with these sights that go against God's word, that turn our attention from holy things to the flesh, we are defiling the most holy place. And what's going to happen to the rest? The whole body is corrupt. If the head is sick, the whole body is sick. Two quick things. Number one, don't lose our main golden thread. Many times, if a spouse is guilty, right, of, of sexual excess, right, and also the factors, repentance must take place for reconciliation to happen, occur between husband and wife. Both may be guilty. Mm -hmm. And that, if both are guilty, that means they are not reconciled with God. Right. So both have to repent now. 
Make sense? And be one with God. Right. Now, would, secondly, would you believe us if we told you this week, and it's only Thursday, we receive communication that there is a husband and a wife that have separated over this issue. The husband says, because the wife doesn't want to give in, he is going to find his pleasure, gratification somewhere else with somebody else. And the wife caught him committing adultery. And his excuse was, you kept yourself aloof, so you put me in that predicament. That's what we're talking about right here. All right, Psalm 101. Mm. Let's take a look at verse 3. The sight now, Hillary. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. So what about, a, what about the sight here? I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Job 31. And let me just say yes. that things don't have to be X-rated to show we'll pornographic um, mm. material. Because we shouldn't be watching movies anyway. Period. I don't care what they're about. We shouldn't be watching them. But people think, well, I'm not watching any pornography or any X-rated things. But I mean, even on the news, they show, you know, things that are... So we shouldn't watch news. stimulate... Hillary? Well, Hillary I mean... Hillary said we shouldn't watch news. <laughs> shouldn't watch news. Go ahead, Hillary. So I'm just saying we have Job to be 31. very careful of what we put before our eyes because we cannot erase. Once you see something, it's seared into your brain. Right. You have to ask God supernaturally to, to brainwash you of that, of what you behold with your eyes. Some of us are so seared, and some people trace their sexual intemperance back to images that they've seen when they were little kids. And that's where I'm going. Because many times, and that's what we want this lesson to do, to take the mask off. Job 31, we have been wearing the masks in the church, right? And what we're saying in this lesson is the mask must come off. And many times the things that we see and watch, it, those things lodge in our conscience. And we try to play them out in the bedroom. You watch what we cover next. Job 31 verse 1, what it says here, Hillary? I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? This is, ch friends, I got, two, I got three books right here, which cover, in essence, everything we're seeing. The Bible, that's one. Okay, four books. Bible, that's, that's one. The Adventist Home, that's two. Child Guidance. Look at some statements. I'm going to quote from this book, Child Guidance. All right? And, of course, testimonies on sexual behavior, adultery, and divorce but look carefully at some of the quotes from child guidance as I go through this book we go through it we realize this has nothing to do with children if so it's secondary but it has primarily everything to do with the husband the wife the father the mother parental guidance <laughs> thank you so much Hillary. look at the statement right here page 439 child guidance they, husband, wife, they read everything they can obtain. Exciting love stories and impure pictures have a corrupting influence. Novels are eagerly perused by many, and as a result, as the result, their imagination becomes defiled. Now, back then they read novels. Now, now today people still read novels. And magazines. Magazines, what else? Television. Yeah, movies, television. television. It says, in the cars, photographs of females in a state of nudity are frequently circulated for sale. Do you know what came to my mind also? Washington, D.C. If you've ever been there, you see all these statues. All these statues. Mm -hmm. all, they are all nude. It's true. What does that do that to the art. mind, especially of men? Art? That's, That's the art of it. Satan. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah. All right. What does that do to the man? That's why I believe there's so much abomination, immorality from these politicians. It's what they behold every single day. And they drink wine and eat flesh food and eat late at night. And watch all kind of filth. Let's move on. These disgusting pictures. Are also found in... Photoshops. Okay. 
and are hung upon the walls of those who deal in engravings. This is an age when corruption is teeming everywhere. The lust of the eye and corrupt passions are aroused by beholding and by reading. Mm. The heart is corrupted through the imagination. The mind takes pleasure in contemplating scenes which awaken the lower and baser passions. These vile images, seen through defiled imagination, mm. corrupt the morals and prepare the deluded, infatuated beings to give loose rein to lustful passions. Do you see what is at the root? What they see. What they see. Then follow sins and crimes, which drag beings formed in the image of God down to a level with the beasts, sinking them at last in what? To perdition. So is what we're covering here salvific? It is. Absolutely. And put this point down, the same factors that lead to sexual excess, those same factors lead to animal practices in the bedroom as husband and wife have sexual intercourse. Not just sexual excess now, but the animal practices and the same factors that lead to the sexual excess lead to what again, Hillary? Uh, the, animal the animal practices, practices in the bedroom. Go to Hebrews 13, because this scripture is what they use to justify their animal practices in the bedroom. All right, my friends, and many a husband and a wife will be lost if they don't stop the animal practices in their sexual intercourse in their bedrooms. And remember, please, friends, please hear me now. Hear me now. If you did not know, God winked. But now he's saying, make thorough repentance in your heart. Break up the fallow ground of your heart. Amen. Change before it is too late. You are, you are literally expelling, not demons, but expelling the holy angels from the most holy place in your home, wow. which is your bedroom. Mm. And you think because marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, we can do anything like animals in the bedroom? God forbid, my friends. And this not only go up, goes for husband and wife, but also those who are contemplating marriage. You need counsels to guide you along. And the mere fact these things are written in the Bible, in the spirit of prophecy, we must proclaim it with a loud voice. Why is it we skip around these points in Adventist home? Some of you have never heard these things before. I wonder why. So the very thing that we are afraid to touch may very well be the, our ruin. Mm -hmm. the cornerstone. You remove that cornerstone, the whole thing crumbles. Because many a husband and a wife are singing, we are marching to Zion, and they're not going to heavenly Zion. They're going to hell. Animal practices in the bedroom. Before I take Hebrews 13, mm -hmm. let's set the stage with Adventist home, page 124. What is the result of giving loose rein to the lower passions? The bedchamber where angels of God should preside is made unholy by unholy practices. Now we mentioned we're trying to get to the most holy place. Right now we're in the holy place with the bread. Nothing defiling can come into God's presence. And as you mentioned, the most holy place of the house. Correct. The, you know, there should be a sacred circle. Angels of God should preside Correct. in there. But how do we dispel them, expel them? Unholy practices. All right. And because shameful animalism rules, shameful what, Hillary? Animalism. Rules, bodies are corrupted. Loathsome practices lead to loathsome diseases. That which God has given as a blessing is made a curse. Wow. So sexual intercourse is a blessing from God, but based on the animal practices, it has now become what? Become a curse. So now we point the finger at the Pope. You have trampled upon God's Sabbath. God's holy day. Holy day. And made it unholy. And we have taken the marriage. Do you see the Sabbath and the marriage? Right. Sixth Do you see and it? seventh day. You see? Mm -hmm. And we would blast the Pope and the Catholic and Church. So. And right, thank you, thank you, Hillary. <laughs> yeah. And rightfully so. Right? And yet with a marriage institution. Mm. That which is to be a blessing, we have made it a curse through sexual excess and animal practices in the bedroom. Wow. 
All right. And as you mentioned, that Babylon is fallen and it has become the habitation of devils. devils. This is saying that angels of God, which should preside in the bedroom, Correct. are expelled and unholy angels come. So our beds are not the habitation of the holy angels, mm. but our bedrooms become the habitations of devils. And in Babylon. In the bedroom, baby? Yes, it's, confu it's animalism. That's All what right. it is, confusion, and, beastly confusion. And in the most holy place, in the literal sanctuary, there's no animal food inside there. No. no animal practices inside there. So you may claim to be in the most holy place, but your practices bring you back not only in the outer court, but outside the gate. Outside the gate. And in the, in the, in the sanctuary, what do we find on the walls? In angels. the sanctuary, angels. angels. But due to, and where must these angels be found? In our home, especially in our bedrooms. Right. But because of unholy and unholy practices, what do we do with those angels? Expel them and bring in unholy. Influences. Page 124, paragraph 5, Adventist Home. The more the animal passions are indulged, the stronger do they become and the more violent will be their clamors for indulgence. Let God-fearing men and women await to their duty. Many professed Christians mm. are suffering with paralysis of nerve and brain because of their intemperance in this direction. So what's happening in these bedrooms? Unholy practices, mm -hmm. shameful animalism rules. Bodies are corrupted. Loathsome practices lead to loathsome what, Hillary? Diseases. Read now Hebrews 13, verse 5, Hillary, for us. What it says now that uh, many folks use mm -hmm. to justify their animalism in their bedrooms. Verse 4, actually. Yes. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now, when I read that animalism, is unholy practice in the bedroom. Since Sister White, under inspiration, gave us an object lesson. What they do, husband and wife in the bedroom, is what we see animals do. Let's pause right there, put these points down. Put them down for your salvation's sake. Do animals lick each other with your tongue? Yes, they do. And that right there would point to oral sex in the bedroom. That is an animalistic practice. It's animalism, as she calls it. Oral sexual intercourse, and we can't say intercourse. Oral sex is an animal practice, both on the male and on the female. Back to our golden thread. If a husband wants it, oral sex, the wife says no, and maybe they were guilty previously, but the wife or the husband is now growing, eating the bread now, and he or she says no, and the husband or wife says, why not? And begin to create problems in the marriage now. They want to be reconciled. Where must we go to the? To the bread, the word of God. Animalism. And what we see akin to this, Hillary, how is, again, again, we're talking about oral sex. How is oral sex linked to lesbianism? Well, down the road. Right. Not, not, not mm -hmm. up the road, but down the road. I would even say homosexuality as well. But before we go there, le lesbianism. Okay, well, basically you, to perform that, you don't really need someone of the opposite gender if you're a woman. And what a, we're seeing here is, know. in some instances, again, you have a wife who wants the husband to perform oral sex, right? And the husband may say no, right? She gets angry, it gets worse, it gets worse. Then she has to find somebody to satisfy that loss. And that's why you find even in the Seventh-day Adventist church, you have bisexuality, bisexuals. Right. Even as a pastor, we just heard of a bisexual pastor. Then you think about it. Now, please don't think about it. Uh, let's stop right there. Lord, please help us. Father in heaven, keep our minds on your word. I know this is sensitive, but it is essential for our salvation. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So we see how oral sex, animal practices can lead to lesbianism. Right. Now, I have seen, I want to ask you, I have seen with animals, dogs, I've seen two male dogs have, uh, what can we call that? Anal. All right, anal sex. And when we see a husband giving his wife anal sex, that is an abomination. And if a husband will give his wife anal sex, 
if the, if, if the opportunity was turned, he would give a man anal sex. That is an abomination in the name of Jesus Christ. Animals do that, not man who right. was created mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. image of God. Now, we're talking about the moral effects that it Correct. has on the body or on the mind and on the spirituality and on the character. It, bring, it brings out the animal propensities. But there's also physical, serious physical health um, health related illnesses that are attributed to Correct. both anal sex yes. and um, oral sex. Correct. So if we're to be stewards of our minds, we're to be stewards of our body, we're to be stewards of everything that God has given to us. And these practices, um, it's been found to lead, lead to Stop. mouth yes, cancers, yes, throat yes, cancers, yes. and the anal, all yes. kind of bacterial, mm. you yeah, know, infections yeah. and so on. And yeah. so the list goes on Correct. and on. Correct. Animal. It wasn't intended Animal that way. loss. Number three. Have you ever heard of threesome? The world speaks of threesome, right? When a number of people come together to have sexual intercourse. Now, you say, well, Pastor, that, that would not be found in a Seventh-day Adventist marriage, a Christian marriage, threesome, foursome. No, no, Pastor, come on, not in our church, no. Now, yes, there, there's a way it happens. When the husband and the wife in their bedroom with their big screen TV, and they watch porn together, pornography together. They watch, um, I mean, I remember growing up, they called it Blue Movie, in Jamaica, Blue Movie. X-rated movies. When you watch that as husband and wife, you are participating in threesome, foursome, you name it, my friends. It is an abomination to God. Right. And that's You're watching also that, man and a woman, you, no friends. And that's also no. homosexuality as well. It's just all, right. all gross confusion. It's, thank you so much, Hillary. It is against God's word. And in the home, in the marriage, these things have to change. Now, even if... Go ahead, Hillary. I was just going to say, how can you invite the Lord? Yes. Everything that we do, do all to the glory of God. Yes. So when you come together as spouses to have a special intimate moment, can you pray <laughs> over these practices? Can you really invite God to be a part of... Of that, you can't. Can't. You can't. He's he's nowhere to be found. Again, not even if husband and wife agree that we want to do these things, it's not what you want to do. It's what God's words say. Amen. Right. Number four. Number four. You know, <laughs> we were talking about this. Have you ever? No, I can't ask you that question. Now, in the world, you have husband and wife in their bedroom. They may go to a store, whatever those stores are, are called, and they buy certain, certain uh, devices. Torture mechanisms. And they would dress their wife a certain way and handcuff her, you know, and beat her with a whip and tie, tie her neck and literally tie her feet and... And acting out. Handcuff her. What's happening there? He's acting out as if he's raping his wife. So what is in his mind? Rape. Abuse. And when the devil sees that, if you would do that, tie your wife up and you beat her and carry on in that bedroom, all that is needed is for the opportunity to be given and you'd rape a woman. Mm. Because the very same thing you're practicing in your bedroom. And sometimes the wife takes on that role as the torturer, and they, they find Vice sick versa. Pleasure. Thank you. Vice yeah, versa. They find sick pleasure out of that. God so, is nowhere in that. So don't be surprised now that we are seeing the, in, the, the spike, the increase of even rape in the church, right? It's happening in the bedroom first. And Sister White says that if wives, hear me carefully, Sister White says, if your husbands are like this, what we have shown, your husband is demon-possessed. And if it's the wife, she is demon-possessed. And just as we talk about giving the gospel to expel demons, this message is also to expel the demons in these people's lives. Look at this mm -hmm. statement right here. Adventist Home, page 126. No man can truly love his wife when she will patiently Submit to become his slave and minister to his depraved passions. 
In her passive, passive submission, she loses the value she once possessed in his eyes. He sees her dragged down from everything elevating to a low level. Mm. And soon he suspects that she will as tamely submit to be degraded by another as by himself. You think about having your wife or your husband lick your bottom. Dogs do that. And when you allow your spouse to lick your rear, I won't go too far on that point. And friends, I want it to sound gross to you. Do you know why? Not until Lot was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, what he was seeing and hearing, he sought God with all of his heart. Mm -hmm. If we don't see the law and how dangerous, degrading. how wicked, how degrading sin is, we won't cry for a savior. If you allow your spouse to lick your rear, you do not really look at your spouse as being made in God's image. No. It's sickness. It's demon possession. It's what you read in the magazines that your parents had under that um, rug or the bed, the mattress back in the day. It's those magazines you were, you were looking at, the novels you were reading. You know, you were movies. peeping and watching your, your, your grown folks watch, watch the blue movies, X-rated movies in the home. And now you grow up, you're unconverted, demons are in your life. You're practicing these things. If you don't change, you're a lost soul. Right. And I'm, I'm so glad that you mentioned Lot here because even with the oral and the anal sex, that, is a, that also um, is how sodomy is defined. Correct. It's not just man with man, woman with woman, but also those are a part of sodomy practices. They're all interrelated. With and sexual intercourse is to bring forth a child. Right. Oral sex and licking someone's rear has nothing to do with or carrying anal. forward a child. Right. Thank you so much. Back to the screen. Let's not go too, too deep on that. It says here, he doubts her. Listen to this carefully. It says, in her passive submission, red words on top, she loses the value she once possessed in his eyes. He sees her dragged down. From her, from everything elevating to a low level. And soon he suspects that she will as tamely submit to be degraded by another man as by himself. He doubts her constancy and purity, tires of her, hmm. and seeks new objects to arouse and intensify his hellish passion. So, what does he seek now? New objects. So, if the wife doesn't satisfy, or even if she does, that animal demon in him, that right. passion. It's like a drug. He needs more, yes. more, more, something to stimulate him even more. So he the looks... objects could be people or be these, these, devices. these amen, devices. The law of God is not regarded. Sister White says these men, these husbands, maybe your husband, are worse than brutes. They are demons in human form. Wow. Read on. They are unacquainted with the elevating, ennobling principles of true, sanctified love. The wife also becomes jealous of the husband and suspects that if opportunity should offer, he would just as readily pay his addresses to another as to her. And he would. That's what the above quote said. She sees that he is not controlled by conscience or the fear of God. All these sanctified barriers are broken down by lustful passions. All that is godlike in the husband is made the servant of low, brutish lust. Can I just say something before we move on? As you think about Christ during the first advent, and you know where I'm going, yes. in the fullness of time, in the chapter of Desire of Ages, Sister White says, before Christ came, the very organs of men were worked by demons. And that's what we're seeing when men and women indulge in these practices. Animal practices. Yes. The demons are there controlling those lustful passions. Correct. And Christ had to put in his appearance. So we know that we're hmm. close to the end when we see this state of thing, not things, not only in the world, but she's given these testimonies and these counsels to people that are professed Adventists, professed Christians. It's going on in many of their homes. Lord have mercy. It is not pure holy love which leads the wife to gratify the animal propensities of her husband at the expense of health and life. Now put this statement down. This is where Sister White gives solution. Gives what, my friends? Solution. So Amen. she's telling the wife what to do if the husband is uh, intemperate, excess, 
if he wants her to carry out animal sexual practices. This statement is rich with solution. Hillary, if she possesses blue words. If she possesses true love and wisdom, she will seek to divert his mind from the gratification of lustful passions to high and spiritual themes by dwelling upon interesting spiritual subjects. So what must she do then? Because t these two things are not in harmony. The animal practices, the right. excess, and what? And the word spiritual of subjects. Spiritual so if the husband is intemperate, want to carry out also animal practices, Lux. what must the wife do? Divert his mind to spiritual Ooh. thoughts Read and on. subjects. It may be. It may be necessary to humbly and affectionately urge, even at the risk of his displeasure, that she cannot debase her body by yielding to sexual excess. That's Jesse? her individuality. Thank you, Hillary. Mm -hmm. Read on. She should, in a tender, kind manner, Remind him that God has the first and highest claim upon her entire mm. being and that she cannot disregard this claim for she will be held accountable in the great day of God. In this matter, so delicate and so difficult to manage, much wisdom and patience are necessary as well as moral courage and fortitude. Next sentence, everybody. Strength, Strength and, and grace. grace can, can be, be found, found in, in what? Prayer. Now, Praise the Lord. Don't, don't think we're through yet. I'm going to share this with you now. What the husband and the wife do in the bedroom, excess, and also the animal practices, when they have children, the children are born with the same intemperance, the same propensities, to these animal practices. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read you a statement that will make you weep. Look at this right here. This is where in the book, A Solemn, a solemn appeal. appeal, where it is stated, when you're pregnant as a wife, do not have sex, right? Mm -hmm. Because as you see, the first section there, the child is begotten in mere what? Mere passion. passion. Mm -hmm. Look at this statement now, friends. Hillary and I, had to read it over and over. I said, Lord, have mercy. What is this? This is uh, Child Guidance, page 442. Parents do not generally suspect that their children understand anything about this vice. In very many cases, the parents are the real sinners. What happens? The children now begin to practice masturbation. What, my friends? Masturbation. Blue words. They have abused. Parents are the ones to blame, partially. They have uh, abused their marriage privileges and by indulgence have strengthened their animal passions. And as these have strengthened, the moral and intellectual faculties have become weak. The spiritual has been overborne by the brutish. Mm. Children are born with the animal propensities largely developed the parents' own stamp of character having been given to them. Children born to these parents will almost invariably take naturally to the disgusting habits, habits of, secret of secret vice. vice. And then Sister White gives a scripture. Tell me which, which text comes to mind. Last sentence. The sins of the parents will be what, Hillary? Visited upon their children. What text comes to mind? Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse mm -hmm. 5. The second commandment. Verse 7. I will visit the iniquities of the fathers upon whom? The children. children. So when parents are intemperate, sexual excess, and they carry out animal practices, the children are born with the same sentiments. Propensities. Propensities. As well as, we are told, they also begin to practice secret Vice. masturbation. Look at the statement now, friends. Here it is. Again, that's child guidance. Look at the statement. Page 441, Child Guidance. Black words, bolded, every small children. Even small children, infants, being born with natural irritability of the sexual organs, find momentary relief in handling them, which only increases the irritation and leads to a repetition of the act until a habit is established, established which increases with their growth. Did you catch that? So children who are born touch themselves, touch themselves, 
to bring pleasure. Relief. Children, maybe they missed it, Hillary. They missed it. Page 441, paragraph 3, child guidance. Hillary, even. Even very small children, infants, and infants are from 0 to 12 months, being born with natural irritability of the sexual organs, find momentary relief in handling them. What's to them? Their sexual, sexual organs. organs. Read on, Hillary. Which only increases the irritation and leads to a repetition of the act until a habit is established which increases with their growth. I want to ask, okay, let's read on. The practice of secret habits surely destroys the vital force of the system, right? Blue words. Among the young, the who, friends? The young. The vital capital, the brain, is so severely taxed at when? At an, an early, early age. age that there is what, Hillary? Deficiency and great exhaustion. Which lead the system exposed to disease of various kinds. Now, I want to ask you a question. Was David, for the great part of his life, also a womanizer? Yes. David. Yep. And who was David's son or, or his, his beloved son? Solomon. Solomon. How many wives he had? Seven. So where did that come from? The father. Mm -hmm. Go to 2 Samuel with me. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. Now, did David have a son called Amnon? Yes. And what was on Amnon's mind? His sister. Incest. To have a sexual intercourse with Tamar, his sister. Did he do it? Did it. Where are we going? Second Samuel, chapter 13, okay. verse 2 through verse 10. We won't read that. Okay. So we see the sins of the father went down to whom? To the children. Solomon. Solomon. How many wives? 7,000? 7, 700 and 300 concubines. Mercy. And it's a possibility that the son that David lost, that um, oh, Bathsheba yes, conceived, yes. his iniquities were visited upon that child because mm. the... That son was conceived in that adulterous fornication type um, Correct. situation. Correct. And of course, we know the consequence was that the child did not live. But it's a possibility had that child lived yes. that he would have been very um, depraved sexually as well. Exactly. Of course, everything is a choice, but um, visiting the iniquity upon the third and fourth generation. And that's why as parents at the right time with the right words, Ask God to give you wisdom to speak to your children. Right. And don't you say they don't need to know this, especially secret vice. Sister Weiss, watch this statement here. This is from Testimonies on Sexual Behavior, page 269. The amount of zinc in semen is such that one ejaculation, how many? One. One ejaculation may get rid of all the zinc that can be absorbed from the intestines in one day. This book right here, Sister White wrote, this is a compilation of Sister White's writings. This has a number of consequences, unless? Unless the amount lost is replaced by an increased dietary intake, repeated ejaculation may lead to a real zinc deficiency with various problems developing, including impotence. And not only impotence, so that means, watch carefully now, that means masturbation leads to what? Impotence. Not only impotence, it leads to insanity. Insanity. Next sentence. And not just masturbation, but also um, excess, excess, like we said. Excess, repeated excess, ejaculate. because, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Let's go. It is even possible, given the importance of zinc for the brain, that 19th century moralists were correct when they said that what? Repeated masturbation could make a person mad. Hmm. Sexual excess will make a person mad. Masturbation as well. So this doesn't mean that you can, continue, you can um, be excessive but just take zinc supplements. No, that's not what it's saying there. The, the sin lies in the intemperance because there's a lot of people that will say, okay, there it is. I, I just need to take more zinc and they'll begin taking, um, you know, supplements, but they're still... Five milligrams excess. a day. Yeah, but they're still uh, uh, indulging in excess. Wonderful, Hillary. Page 444, we're closing. And this portion is addressing masturbation and sexual excess. In, because remember now, Many a husband say, or even a wife, my, 
my wife can't please me, husband can't please me, or they, they are abstaining, let me enjoy myself. Right. You think about this. What is happening to that person's mind when he is masturbating? Who is in the room with that person? Demons. Expel demons from your bedroom, my friends, from your right. life. Where's your mind going? Right. Right? It's either who, on who, self or on somebody else. Demons, Hillary. Right. If the practice is continued from the ages of 15, how many of you have a 15-year-old, a teenager in your home? All right? If the practice is continued from what age, Hillary? From the ages of 15 and upward. Nature will protest against the abuse she has suffered and continues to suffer. And nature will make them pay the penalty for the transgression of her laws, especially... From the ages of 30 to 45. So wait a minute now. So what you did when you were 15, you may not see the consequences now. Mm -hmm. But when you get to 30 to 45, if you're alive, look what you will see now by numerous pains in the system. And various diseases. Such as? Such as affection of the liver and lungs, neuralgia, rheumatism, affection of the spine. Back problems. Mm -hmm, diseased kidneys. And what? And cancerous humors. Why die before your time? Then it says some. Some of nature's fine machinery gives way, leaving a heavier task for the remaining to perform which disorders nature's fine arrangement. And there's often a sudden breaking down of, of the, the constitution. And death is the result. So can masturbation and sexual excess kill? Oh, yes. Is, is this a life and death topic study we are going through right now? Right. And there was a person in Sister White days who say, I want Sister White, James White, to come and pray for me. And Sister White showed up. Please pray for me, James and, and Ellen. And they said, normally we don't do that. He was sick. He was pale and also feeble. And Sister White says, we will see God tonight. And we, we will come tomorrow and tell you what God says. They went home, prayed, and God told them, this man is sick because of masturbation. Even though he was married. Sister White showed up. Listen to what she says next. Page 451 of the book, Child Guidance. Mm -hmm. Red words in the middle. Next morning, Hillary. The next morning, the man came for us to pray for him. We took him aside and told him we were sorry to be compelled to refuse his request. So what did they say? I'm sorry, we cannot pray for you. That's harsh, right? No, it's the truth. Read on. Mm -hmm. I related my dream, which he acknowledged was true. He had practiced self-abuse from his boyhood up, and he had continued the practice during his married life. Here was a man debasing himself daily and yet daring to venture into God's presence and ask an increase of strength, which he had Viol vilely mm -hmm. squandered, and which, if granted, what would he have done? He would consume upon his lust. So do you see why God told James and Sister White not to pray for him? Right. Because if he received healing, what would he return and do? Go right back to the secret vice. And this principle carries over in the area of health. That's why we can't always pray for individuals to get better as it relates to their health. Because they're gonna, if they do get better, they're going to go back to those same health-destroying practices that led them there in the first place. Then Sister White says, this is not a solitary case. Even the marriage relation was not sufficient to preserve this man from the corrupt habits of his youth. So he was married. You would think the marriage would satisfy him, right? No. Wow. No. Was he intemperate? Yes, he was. All right, read on. I wish I could be convinced, Sister White says, that such cases as the one I have presented are rare, but I know they are frequent. In the church. Yep. Now, friends, we have to close right here. We must close right here. And this man, the first sentence, what was he suffering from? My husband and I once attended a meeting where our sympathies were what, Hillary? Were enlisted for a brother who was a great sufferer with the physic. Physic. Physic is a wasting disease of the lungs, like asthma, 
Okay. And also tuberculosis. Mm. I looked it up. So this man was suffering from an upper respiratory problem, lung, lung, lung disease. But the culprit was what? Secret Masturbation. Rise. Wow. That's serious, my friends. It is. All right. Now, can we get victory? Amen. Can okay. these people of sexual excess and also animal practices master? Secret can rise. they get victory? They can in Christ Jesus. Listen what Absolutely. this Absolutely. As we close, page 446 of Child Guidance. Some will acknowledge the evil of sinful indulgences yet will excuse themselves by saying that they cannot overcome their passions. Wow. Oh, I can't overcome. Mm. Sister White says, this is a terrible admission for any person to make who names the name of Christ. Wow. Then Sister White quotes 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse what? 16. All right. Let everyone that nameth right. the name of Christ do what? Depart, Depart from, from iniquity. Second Timothy 2 and verse 19. 19. So she's telling us we can get victory. Oh, yes. Listen to what she says next now in closing. The lower passions have their seats in the body and work through it. The words flesh or fleshly or carnal lusts embrace the lower corrupt nature. The flesh of itself cannot act contrary to the will of God. We are commanded to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. So what must we do? Crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts. How shall we do it? Shall we inflict pain on the body? Answer Hillary. No, but put to death the temptation to sin. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. That's Amen. 2 Corinthians 10. Yes. Casting down what, my friends? Everyone? Imagination. Thank you so much. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. Expel demons, demons. sexual excess, expel animal P practices. practices. The corrupt thought is to be expelled. Every thought is to be brought into captivity to Jesus Christ. All animal propensities are to be subjected to the higher powers of the soul. The love of God must reign supreme. Christ must occupy an undivided throne. Our bodies are to be what? Regarded as his purchased possession. The members of the body are to become the instruments, praise God, of righteousness. Amen. Friends, we must stop here. And I hope by God's grace, these words were clear, convicting. And as husband, as wife, you have seen what the bread says now. Seek God with repentance. Accept his pardon. Accept he has now literally declared you clean. He has also pardoned you. Now you can walk without guilt. Walk in peace in Christ. And when those temptations come, claim a promise. Cast down those evil thoughts. Sing the songs of Zion. And Christ will give you victory that your marriage, your life, your home will be pleasing in the sight of God. Even yourself will be pleased. Your, your life will be pleasing in the sight of God. Christ is soon to come. We do not want to hear the words from his lips. Depart from me. You are a worker of iniquity. And even though men may say otherwise, you have seen what God's word says. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for your word of life. We pray for your people that they will be like the Bereans. Accept these words, search for themselves, leave these things out and teach them to others that you may have a church prepared for your coming, faithful, loyal, a church that is not demon-possessed, but Holy Spirit-controlled, inspired. Save us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right, friends. I want to thank you again for joining us. And by God's grace, we will resume on next Thursday for one more session, Marriage Reconciliation Through God's Sanctuary. And of course, this coming Sabbath at 11.30 a.m., please join us for our Sabbath worship. 
God bless until we meet again.